die, Padre. There's nothing left. Ever since I was a child, I had a feeling that something was missing in me. I want to know why I'm here. Can any of us know that? Become yourself. Then God and the devil don't matter. Radio headquartered on the west coast of Sweden. I'm Henrik Palmgren and all of us at Red Eyes are as always glad that you're here and interested in listening and learning more about many of the subjects that we find worth spending some time on. Please see RedEyesCreations.com for more independent investigations into cover-ups, controversies and conspiracies. This is a radio program that covers a lot of different subjects. Many of these others won't even touch and some of these you might not even like. Well, we're not afraid to uh, look into the claims in order to get a better understanding of many of the fringe subjects that are floating around in these strange and confusing times. The truth and the claims of what the truth is will lead us where it may. We take the opportunity to hear about it and investigate it for ourselves, all to be able to make up our own minds, just as we hope that it will aid you to make up yours. Harry Hubbard has written, arranged, directed and produced over 20 videos for Alexander Helios focused on various archaeological sites. He has also written several non-fiction books, reports and articles concerning the archaeological discovery in Marion County, Illinois. Harry is with us to discuss the intriguing and bizarre story of the Illinois Caves, first discovered in spring 1925 by a local resident, Orville Lowry, of Hickory Hill in the southeast corner of Marion County in Illinois. In the first hour, Harry tells us the story of how this discovery unfolded, the characters involved, and how he arrived on the scene. Harry and fellow researchers were able to amass large quantities of information from the artifacts as to who the people were that constructed the Illinois Mystery Cave and the identities of the corpses who lay interred within it. These claims are profound and does not only challenge the mainstream archaeological community, but also brings to the surface yet again the suppression of ancient America's true history. Harry Hubbard, welcome. Thank you for coming on the program. I've been uh, watching many of your video presentations here in the uh, last uh, well couple of weeks, basically, and I can't wait to talk with you more about your findings today. So, first of all, thank you for coming on and talking with us today, Harry. Thank you. Now, I know you're struggling a little bit with a with a cold, and you'll be, of course, very... Uh, uh, gracious to give us some of your time anyway, so I hope we can make this uh, convenient for you as well today, Harry. Oh, likewise. Thank All right, you. definitely, you bet. Now, um, why don't we kind of, let's introduce you a little bit to this story that we're going to discuss about first. I mean, I think it might be pertinent to go back to 1925 and obviously talk about the uh, the finds itself, but just give us briefly, uh, if you will, Harry, a little bit on your background and, and how you got involved in this story that we're going to talk about today. I've always been uh, very interested in American antiquities. My father was uh, very interested in ancient civilizations here in North America. He had lived out west, and when I was a child, he, we would go to different mound complexes, and I had developed a theory that at some point in time, the ancient Romans or, or peoples from the Mediterranean had come here. And or or Phoenicians, Libyans, um, uh, Egyptians, 
And, of course, uh, the indoctrination of American school is to, um, is to ponderate that, uh, 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 that Columbus was first, that nobody was here before Columbus. And, and I always thought, well, Columbus got here and met the Indians. <sighs> so, and then as time drew on, I kind of thought that something happened in the timeline that we were unaware of, that there was a warp in the timeline as far as the history of North America was concerned that we all missed, that there was just something missing because there was just too much evidence of advanced cultures that were here. And it's in, all, in every state, all over this country, everywhere. And the, this continent was peopled by many thousands and thousands of, uh, of, 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 uh, of persons, ancient uh, tribes and civilizations, and the evidence was everywhere. And so later in life, I just kept reading. I'm, I love reading, and I've read thousands of books and just kept uh, all of this in the back of my mind. And uh, I went to look you know, for some of these uh, ancient cultures and try to put some pieces of the puzzle together that made sense to me. And my library was filled with books from the 1800s, concerning North American antiquities. And a lot of these scholars that wrote um, history books in the 1800s, they would start their history books out with the mound builders, whereas uh, they were called United States history books. All the United States history books printed in the 1800s, the first chapters are all of mound builders and ancient civilizations. And then in the early 1900s, we had this new kind of history book come about that was called American History. And the American History books either started with Columbus, the Pilgrims, or the Revolutionary War. And they left out a lot of the information concerning the mound builders and the ancient sun-worshipping cultures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the, many of the writers uh, in the 1800s, they would all um, postulate that that the Carthaginians, that the Phoenicians, that the Romans or, or, or some other Mediterranean tribes had been here. And they had uh, um, come here and the evidence was here. Well, later in life I was to learn that they all were here. The Celts, the Vikings, the Egyptians, the uh, Romans, uh, the Phoenicians, they were all here. And that was my interest. Indeed, yeah, it, it's a fascinating story. I mean, I can't, I, I don't still really understand why this official story is still going on. We've talked about it on this program many times before. Uh, I brought up, brought up uh, you know, Vinland when the Vikings came over to basically Newfoundland today. Um, we've we've talked with people like David Hatcher Childress about the, you know, the legend of uh, uh, Grand Canyon's Egyptian artifacts and everything else. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously, what we're going to focus on today, Harry, is 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 a different twist to it, but yet it connects with many of these stories as well. Why don't we then backtrack to around 1925 and, and, and basically detail of what happened in, in Marion uh, County here first? Well, a lot of it starts with David Hatcher Childers. He is a Renaissance man. And I, uh, I had purchased several of his books, and that is what got me into all this trouble. But to go back to 1925, there was a man uh, in, who lived in Hickory Hill, Illinois, and this is approximately, you're looking like 11 miles east of Interstate 57 in southeast Marion County, Illinois. And he is out on a piece of property with his two daughters. One of them is six and the other one is four. And he's got his old pickup truck there. And they are picking up um, stones to make a garden and back then a lot of the land was cleared and they they constantly every year they'd have to go and pick up stones well I found out later the stones they were picking up were actually axe heads arrowheads spearheads just by the by the bucket by the truckload and he would take them and dump them and he was uh, out with his two daughters and his six-year-old daughter named Fern um, his name was Orville Lowry, Fern Lowry, uh, found a hole 
on the side of a bluff. There's there are ravines here. The there are, the strata has a um, surfacing sandstone, and the water um, force over periods of time has cut these r rather large ravines. They're oh 15 to 20 feet deep and 70 to 100 feet wide. And she had found a hole, and her father came over, Orville came over, and he saw some uh, some markings, and he saw uh, different things there, and he's like, wow, this is something really nice. So he tried to get the um, scholars, the archaeologists and scholars involved and interested in it, from the uh, local universities, uh, from Carbondale and Champaign-Urbana. And they didn't want to hear of it because they told him that they didn't have any record of anything there. So, which coincidentally, there are mounds all over this area. Right where I'm, I'm uh, speaking to you from, I'm at uh, a really nice state-of-the-art uh, recording studio called Lost Recording. And uh, this studio is actually on an ancient mound settlement and they're all around me right now yeah nice. and where i actually live i live on a ridge that is uh, that people have inhabited for thousands of years and so or orville was just um perturbed that no one was interested in it but then in the 1930s, the late 1930s, uh, one of uh, part of uh, President Roosevelt's New Deal was um, a a program called WAPA, um, Work Project Assistance or something like that, and they would hire one person in a township to record local history, and so uh, Orville got his story into some type of WAPA papers, but it was actually entered into the courthouse. Well, uh, there was, what, 35 years later, um, in 1961, one of the uh, America's premier treasure book writers named uh, Michael Paul Henson, was, he went from town to town researching ghost towns, and he knew how to go to these courthouses of these little uh, county seats and look up the records and find ghost towns or where places used to be of activity and such and he discovered Orville Lowry's story at that time Orville Lowry lived in a in a in a village south of us called Mount Vernon actually Mount Vernon all of these towns around here that are called Mount Mount Vernon Mount Erie they're all built on ancient mounds <laughs> and Mount Vernon actually is called the King City because that's where a king was on the ancient mound when the white people came. So um, so he found, he got up with uh, Orville Lowry and Orville Lowry actually took him to the site. Orville was so excited, he called his daughter and said, wow, you know, this, this, uh, this guy's actually interested. He's like 35 years down the road. <laughs> so, uh, so Orville was, was very happy to get his uh, story into, um, into a treasure book. And then subsequently, it was recorded in other treasure books. Orville, unfortunately, died in 1974. And as, as metal detectors became more popular here in the United States, there, were more, there was more interest in the treasure books and the treasure guides. And so people would buy a metal detector, and they would get, as a bonus, a free treasure book. And so what essentially happened in 1982 is a man purchased a metal detector and correlated. Uh, he, well, he was presented with one book when he bought the detector, and then he, got another, he bought another treasure book. Well, the, the same site was listed in both treasure books from different directions. So he correlated them. And he had a good idea where this hole was. And it said in, the, in both of the uh, treasure books that Orville believed gold had been there because there were gold traces or nuggets or 
or size that uh, that there was gold nearby or something. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. be it in the creek or something like that. So, in night uh, first week of April 1982, he ventured into the area here and. Um, one of the local ladies and her husband escorted him down to this ravine system. And then he uh, found the hole that same week. And and then uh, he had no more contact with the people who escorted him down there. And it was his discovery pretty much stayed on the back burner until 1991 when he... Uh, and another author co-wrote a book together, and it was called Mystery Cave of Many Faces. And there, he had been pulling out artifacts by the hundreds, by the thousands, and they're just amazing artifacts. And they all had scripting on them, or many, many of them had uh, archaic writing on them. And the scholars called it all a hoax because... Number one, he wouldn't take them to the site. He wouldn't tell them where it was at. And they couldn't decipher the script. And come to find out, many of the scholars who were attempting to decipher the script, they were trying to read it backwards. Um, There was a mindset here with our academia that all things are written from left to right. So that's how they were trying to read it. And it's written from right to left, mostly. And it's also written back and forth, most are feeding, it's written up, it's written down. Uh, One tablet will be up from the bottom, then you flip it over, then it's read up from the bottom, from the other side. So, uh, uh, so in 1994, my friend Paul, who's also in all the videos, he uh, busted this script. It was an archaic form of Latin, borrowing Punic characters, and... Uh, it, the what the story that they told was just absolutely amazing, and that's one of the things that I'd like to go into during your second hour is actually what the artifacts say and what they talk about. And I think that if we keep this segment um, pretty much central in on the story and what happened uh, to us, and and as we as everything unfolded. Then we'll get back to the artifacts later. Yeah, definitely. It sounds like a good idea. I wanted to backtrack just briefly here uh, to make sure we got some of the names right. When you, um, when we were back in 1982, there we're talking about Russell Burroughs, correct? Which is, you know, obviously where the the caves been named after, as we consequently know them, the the Burroughs Caves. Is that correct? It's known in some circles as the Burroughs Cave. We prefer to call it the Lost Tomb, or uh, other people have dubbed it the Illinois Caves. Um, that's that's how we are on Facebook and Twitter, the Illinois Caves. Our uh, website is called IllinoisCaves.com, and so we don't we don't call it Burroughs Cave. I don't mention uh, that in any of our books. Um, um, but uh, but yeah, it was known before we came along as a Burroughs Cave. Yeah, that's right. Uh, do we? There was a is a long time here, obviously, when it was largely. As far as we know, anyway, Harry, uh, un- undiscovered. No one knew about it from the time of Orwell, then up to uh, to Burroughs, basically. Uh, did, do you think that anything happened during that time? Was there any kind of uh, uh, looting going on or anything like that? Before Russell Burroughs got in it, no, I do not believe that there was any looting going on at all. And we, after Russell Burroughs started removing artifacts and gold pieces. Uh, There's some silver pieces that we have a record of also. And he did pull and remove and gain tremendous profit off of sales of artifacts, off of melting down gold pieces. And a little more discretion would have been much appreciated. However, if he had um, if he had just taken pictures of the artifacts and he could have sold the pictures and made as big a fortune just selling the pictures. Yeah, <laughs> and but that didn't happen. So it, it, it's good in one way, bad mostly. But he did bring out the artifacts that that we were able to uh, uh, sift through, and and Paul pull, pull, pulling out alphabetic characters and and then phonetically deciphering the um, the tablets 
and the story that they told was just incredible. And and so I can uh, um, I can tell you that story. We can go back and answer more questions. Yeah, sure. I mean, well, let's just kind of carry on here, obviously, in, in the timeline a little bit, if you will. Uh, as far as I know, it's the most important time here for, for you when you got involved, Harry, is around 1995, correct? How did you, so, so tell us about how you finally uh, got into this stuff with the cave and everything. I first spoke to, well, I was speaking to David Hatcher Childress, I believe it was in 92, because I was, I was really fascinated with his books. Uh, and he had uh, written about Burroughs Cave, and he recommended some other books uh, and articles about Burroughs Cave, which I purchased, and I really wasn't um, prepared at the time to purchase uh, Fred Reed Holmes' book because it was it was very expensive. And I said, "Well, let's find out a little bit more." So I ended up buying David Hatcher's uh, uh, books and and some of the other stuff, and then eventually got the Mr. Cave Many Faces. And I was uh, just shopping through David Hatcher Childress's World Explorers catalog, and. David Hatcher Childress described a lot of the stuff and 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 uh, had some handwritten hand hand uh, drawings of some of the artifacts and it was all it was all pretty good and and I spoke to him about it and he was very knowledgeable he's a very nice fellow and and uh, so I pretty much developed a rapport with him uh, back in I guess it was ninety two or ninety three and it was in. Um, I guess '93 that I met Paul, yes, and then we did the uh, the map video in winter of 1994, and I was speaking to Burroughs. We spoke to Burroughs. I guess it was summer of '93 first. We wanted more information. Paul was interested in it. I was very interested in it uh, because anything North American antiquities was right up my lane, and I was just into it. And he it was uh, well. There is no more information. You can buy this book. You can get this book, and and I don't have any more pictures. I don't have any more artifacts. I'm I'm really at a loss. I can't help you out. And so, which we later uh, grew to know that that was not the case at all. Hmm. And um, so, but he was all ready to sell me plenty of artifacts. So I started purchasing artifacts from him, and that was in uh, summer of '94. Paul busted the script in June of 1994 after we had made uh, the Lazeria map collection video and from the, and we spoke to Burroughs and uh, and that's pretty much where our books where book one starts to really pick up on and all the things that happened and and all the things that Burroughs did to us even at the initial dawning stages of all this do you, do you care to enlighten uh, our listeners who don't know about this a little bit? What what happened there? A lot of trauma. A lot of trauma. He uh, he uh, gave my 800 uh, toll free line to dozens and dozens of people, and the phone was just ringing off. I had it set up to sell uh, CDs. I'm a music publisher and producer, and uh, and plus I did other I do other things as well, and I had a a large electric motor shop, rewinding shop, machine shop, and I had my 800 line coming into one of my offices to sell um, um, CDs from like uh, Ted Neely, Michael Rapp, Glass Hammer, and to take orders and, and to do shipping. And, and the phones were just off the hook and we just told everybody, hey, you know, leave us alone. We, we had no idea that Burroughs was going to do that to us. And that was just at the very, very beginning. And when I told him, man, I don't appreciate you giving everybody all right, hundred number, he just laughed at me in the face over the phone. Just ah. <laughs> we had no idea at the time who we were dealing with or what we were dealing with. And so a year later, in 1994, is when I... Uh, uh, well, we Paul broke the script. We started piecing together the story, and we made our first decipherment tape in summer of '94. And after that video was done, I had uh, contacted Burroughs and said, "You need to see this. We, we've got the decipherments for you to see." Um, and I can I've got the videotape here, and I and you can um, you can watch it. 
So we set a date and for September of 94. And before I left, I was building a studio in Chattanooga with uh, my Glass Hammer buddies. And before I left, he tried every excuse in the world to keep me from coming up there to show him this video. And if I was him and I'd made the discovery, I want to see somebody decipher the tablets. I would have, I, I couldn't, we couldn't understand, you know, why he was so sure. evasive, you know, yeah. and this and that. So, um, so finally, we um, sketched in a date. I, I drove up to Illinois, Alney, which is a town about 45, 50 miles away from here. And uh, I stayed in a hotel there, and I uh, set up my uh, video machine, and he came over, and uh, he watched the video, and it freaked him out. Freaked him out really, really bad. You know why? Uh, you tell me. He jumped up, and he was grabbing his face, pacing the floor, going, when it came, when it came, when the, one of the decipherments, when the, the decipherment came in on the screen that put it all together, uh, Bas uh, Achilles Upelio, it was King Alexander of Pella. And he just freaked out. He, he put his hands over his face and started playing, oh, sweating bullets going, oh, my God, oh, my God, what have I done? Oh, my God, oh, my God, what have I done? What have I done? And when I'm like, you know, I'm, I grew up in our Mercy, Georgia. I'm like, well, ain't he happy? You know, <laughs> it's like, well, he should be happy. <laughs> he, found, he found an ancient Mediterranean Macedonian tomb that, from Egypt that people's been looking for for 2,000 years. <laughs> and uh, and he was just freaking out, and so and that's what the whole story was about, and that's what that's what happened. And involved with all this is everything you could imagine. If anywhere in the world someone had found the crypt of the Ptolemaic dynasty, in his book Mister K Many Faces, and also in the Shears book Rock Art Pieces from Burroughs Cave. Uh, Burroughs describes a series of crypts in a man-made cavern system. And he accessed it near or through the hole that was found in 1925. And there were 12 crypts. One of them had a woman in it. The others were all male. And way in the back, and far in the back, he had rolled back a big, a large stone, and inside it, there was a man interred in a solid gold coffin. And this is what he writes. And it's hard for somebody to make up that kind of stuff. You just don't make up, hey, I found a, 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 an ancient king buried in a gold coffin. Well, that does narrow it down a bit because there aren't that many ancient kings buried in solid gold coffins. It's it's a it's a very s s strange kind of way that obviously uh, you know Russell acts and, and and what happens here and and I'm still trying to you know struggle a bit to, to as to why but you know let's just shift over a little bit and 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 for audience who've never heard about this story before kind of uh, give give them a little bit of a chronology of of what we uh, think we, we know today about exactly who it is what the evidence is for who okay. it is and and how we how we got there we could back up. 2,000 years, if you so okay. uh, will, Harry. Yeah. All right. So what happens is, is after the uh, Battle of Actium, Mark Antony and Cleopatra basically flee, or the wind blows, or so many theories about that, but they go back to Alexandria. Now, it took uh, Octavian and his army, because they were marching over the land of the Hellespont and down through Syria, um, Tyre, the um, eastern Mediterranean coast. It took them about a year to get there. Because he knew that Mark Anthony and Cleopatra weren't going anywhere. So, so by the time he got there, it was like a year later. And during that time, all kind, that, that span of one year, there are all kinds of things that took place. And we have to look at Queen Cleopatra, Queen of Queens. She was absolutely brilliant. And it had to have been her idea. Now, at this time, she had three children by Mark Anthony. And Helios and Selene, the sun and the moon, which were twins. And then she had little baby uh, Philadelphus, who was like five or six years younger than they were. So she got the bright idea, we believe, to whisk the family Sema 
out of Alexandria. Now, how she did it, we're not sure. She could have uh, uh, taken the ships, lots of the gold or whatever, and gone to the, taken it to the Red Sea, and then gone south around the Horn of Africa, and then come up uh, to back up into Iberia, Spain, Cadiz, and or she could have gone through the Mediterranean Sea. We do have evidence. It's speculation at this time. We, we're not sure. But if she had gone through the Mediterranean Sea, my theory is that it would have had to have been ships, and they would have had to constantly change flags. Some of the ships on these stones, uh, the flags are different. And they could have sailed to a certain point under like a Roman flag, then put up this kind of flag, this kind of flag, in, other, in, uh, in order to evade detection. And from there, sailed over to North America. Now, what she did was, is she pulled up all of the, the family mausoleum, the, the semen that was in the mausoleum. That is, all of the bodies, the cadavers of her ancestors. All right, from Ptolemy Soter the first, all the way down to uh, her father, Ptolemy, uh, um, the, pipe, uh, the pipe player, <sighs> excuse me, Aletes Teba, her father, and just whisked them all up and got them on a ship. Now, sometime later, her son, Alexander Helios, did uh, get her body and take it also. So, at the time, there was uh, a lot of sacrifice. Uh, there, was, there, was, there, there was a lot of persecution. Octavian persecuted a lot of, uh, of uh, Mark Anthony's uh, soldiers, and they didn't want to they did not want to serve under Octavian. They thought he was a wimp. So here Octavian's got, what, 50,000 soldiers that he does not want to try to control. So it looks like 50,000 people came over here at one whack. And the, uh, the featured cadaver in the crypt of the Ptolemies was Alexander the Great. But he wasn't the Great then. He was Alexander of Pella. And he was the actual initiator of the Ptolemaic dynasty, such that um, Philip II, King Philip, who's Alexander the Great's father, gave Legas, Ptolemy Soter, the first's father, his favorite concubine, his favorite concubine, and she was pregnant at the time. So that was Ptolemy Soter. So Alexander the Great and Ptolemy Soter the first were actually half brothers. And so from that, a lot of people all over the world are making a lot of money looking for Alexander the Great's body or his entombment sure. without ever giving it any thought whatsoever that they were all buried together. <laughs> they were all buried. And, and we've been out on this limb now for, what, 19 years. Uh, well, I guess... Uh, I guess uh, next month or so, it'll be initiating the 20th year that we have been saying that Alexander the Great, the entire Ptolemaic dynasty, including Queen of Queens, Cleopatra, are all interred right here in Marion County. And no one the world over has proven anything other. <laughs> and all the evidence just seems to keep coming up more and more and more and more so. It's it's an amazing claim, and and uh, you know it's it's we'll we'll obviously get into the details of this here, and uh, let's just uh, try to answer this first. Um, why did they end up in Illinois? Uh, they were lost. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there's a massive river system that goes through the central part of this country. You go up the Mississippi River, and where the Mississippi River, which bisects the, the country here. You go up the Mississippi River, you come to the Ohio River. Where they meet, the Ohio River is like twice as wide as the Mississippi. So they, they just made an easterly turn, and they went up the Ohio River for, what, 100, 120 miles maybe or so, and then they come to another large river called the Wabash River today, and it's got ancient settlements. All these rivers have ancient settlements thousands of them on both sides of the riverbanks. They went up the Wabash River, then they turned, uh, went westerly up the Little Wabash River, and then they went up the Skillet Fork River, 
and and then basically up the Lick Branch. And we don't know what these rivers looked like back then. Yeah. But but Illinois, coincidentally, is four fifths natural boundaries surrounded by rivers. Now Illinois is is has the Mississippi River on one side, the Ohio River on the other side. In the, the boundary of Illinois, you have the Illinois River, the Missouri River comes to the western side of Illinois. You also have the Wabash River, and along with that, the Tennessee and the Cumberland River are all right in the vicinity of Illinois. There are there is no other state that has so many of our large it has every lar- all the largest rivers of our country either border or make the border of Illinois. Hmm. And there was a lot of game here, I'm sure there's all kinds of nut trees and there's lots of fruits and stuff. And and the uh the uh latitude, the way the stars look is somewhat similar to what you would see in the northern Mediterranean uh area there. Yeah. So they basically fled, right? That's the first thing we need to clarify, though. They they decided to get out, and, and as far as we know, so I, I've understood the story as well, they knew where they were going because of their relationship to uh, King Juba II, correct? Well, uh, as Pliny records, King Juba II was a master of the Atlantic Ocean. He knew the Mediterranean and the Atlantic better than anyone. And, um, and so... We'll get more into artifacts and what they say about him a little bit later. Yeah. But uh, yes, the the five people who are mostly responsible for what happened here are um, Queen of Queens, Cleopatra, uh, Octavia, Octavian's sister, King Yuba II, Selene, and Alexander Helios. So three women and two men. And... With Yuba's knowledge and his maps, I'm sure he, he he directed them exactly where to go. And there is the possibility that he did actually sail over here. There was commerce back and forth. We can see that there was commerce within these uh, the artifacts. There was uh, um, there was trade. Uh, there was probably copper um, um, loaded back and forth, and you know. There, it's it. It was it was no secret. They, it was just a land that was far away. It's what twenty one days sail to get here, and uh, it, evidently they went back and forth. Hmm. Yeah, the uh, trans uh, cultural diffusion, as they as they call it, seemed to have been commonplace. The, the further back you go, and with the uh, Phoenician seafarers and and their knowledge of the seas and and everything else, uh, it's, it definitely seems to have been passed down to consequent people, and there was. Uh, large knowledge, knowledge about you know the Americas at that point, and then either we're talking about a effective uh, cover up later in history, or because of circumstances they um, forgot this or neglected this, and we can certainly you know talk about that later if you need to. But l- let's talk about the the location, I guess, of 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 the caves and, and and the layout. I mean, you've you've been there yourself how many times, Harry? Oh, I I live three miles from it, um, so three and a half miles or so. And I have not been inside it. I do not have permission to go inside it. We did our uh, earth resistivity tests, and we found there's two large ravines. One of them has a cavern system in it, and the one to the west has a large room underneath the ground about 10 feet. And I, uh, uh, I'm, my hands are tied because uh, uh, the owner of the property wants to sell the, the land. And whoever buys it can you know, own your own uh, Egyptian tomb full of the uh, most famous kings and queens in all of history. Does the owner know this? Oh, yeah. I, I, I kept him totally abreast years ago. In the state of Illinois, if you find something on someone's property and then you purchase that property later without notifying that owner, then they can uh, uh, get their land back. It's uh, some kind of um, truity clause or something. In other words, if you go and you uh, you know there's oil on somebody's property, and then you buy the mineral rights to it for real cheap, and then you go and put up a well that's pumping 300 gallons a day, 
of oil. Well, you know, he can come back and say, oh, you know, this and that. So it was all always my intent to be uh, above board on everything. Hmm. Uh, does the owner r recognize this? Has he, he explored this himself? How much in communication are you uh, with him? I, it can be her, of course, as well. He does not appear to be that interested. Now, really? there wow. is there is uh, some discrepancy because um, the History Channel had told me that he's a big fan of their show. So, so he, and he's going to let them on his property. And I told him, I said, you know, this is the best way to get the money that you want. He wants an exorbitant amount of money for the property. Mm -hmm. Okay, which is okay. You know, if I, I it. it It took me what over eight hundred thousand to figure out exactly what it was through the years, and if somebody else came back that even had near that much, you know, I, I just ran out. You know, I, I got tapped clean, but I had to. I, you know, people say, "Well, that was stupid." You know, what well, you have to do that when you make a discovery of this magnitude, you have to follow through with it. You have no choice. Your fate is sealed. My fate is sealed, and that's why we, for twenty years or so. That we've been saying this, we're Paul and I are either the biggest fools that ever walked this planet, or we do have the IQs. We do. We have been well read. We do know these uh, uh, ancient languages. We have done our homework. In the meantime, as I have said before, no one the world over has proven us wrong at all. Now, uh, if you don't mind me asking, then do, do you know how much she actually wants for? For the property? For oh, the yeah, one million bucks. One million bucks. Yeah, which isn't that out of the way here, you know? I mean, well, you know, uh, I, considering what the what the potential might be here, but isn't it weird that he, he, he wants money for the property, but he doesn't seem to be that interested in what's actually there then? <laughs> well, his contention is, is, Harry, if I let you own that property and you don't find it, which to me is a non-issue, he said, then I can't get my price for it. <laughs> as long as Harry Hubbard says that that tomb is right there, that land is worth something. That's his contention, which is it's his. He bought it. So, you know. so it's a kind of a little deadlock situation here, basically. He bought it in the year 2000, and I had uh, met him, and uh, I had known him five years previous to that, And he knew exactly what we were doing out there. He, because I used to have a lease on the property. He knew exactly who, what we were saying, and and when it came up for sale, he bought it. He's a wealthy man. He's not worried about the price of gas. So, <laughs> so let let's talk about what has been found so far, and if there's any. I mean, who who has been in there, and and what have they found basically at this stage? <sighs> Russ Burroughs pulled out that we know of. It looks like about 1,100 to 1,200 pounds of gold. He has also pulled out that I have seen with my own eyes probably about 3,500 artifacts. Some big, some small, some huge, some, some tiny. Uh, a myriad of subjects, uh, statues, um, medallions, silver coins, you name it. Just. Just everything that you would expect to find in the Ptolemaic crypt with Queen Cleopatra. That's how her name is spelled on the tablets, Cleopatra. It's not Cleopatra, it's Cleopatra, which uh, a modern-day forager probably wouldn't have known, you know. So, uh, and just, uh, um, there's there's been artifacts found all through this area. Uh about a mile and a half from where this tomb is located in a creek bed. Oh, about 10 years ago, a guy uh, was out with his buddy and he found a, uh, a staff head, the head that goes on the top of a wooden staff, like a king staff. He found one of those in the creek, pristine piece. I mean, beautiful piece. And there have been people that have found through the years all kinds of uh, Egyptian amulets, um, uh, elephant carvings, carvings of lion figurines through the, in the mounds here. And this entire area, coincidentally, is called Little Egypt. And why it's called Little Egypt, nobody really knows, but I'm thinking it may be some 
Mennonite boy uh, years and years ago, back in the 1800s, probably found um, an artifact with Egyptian hieroglyphs on it. Who knows? Well, there's been a lot of those uh, finds, allegedly. There, there. Uh, uh, one article I was going through before uh, we began talking here today is, is, is these very much, I mean, it looks like Anubis pretty much holding a, a staff and there's writing next to him, these gold, you know, artifacts. Um, and I'm also trying to just figure out here, is the, the f photographies of all these artifacts that you show both in your uh, videos and, and that's available on the websites and everything else, else is this uh, done by, by Burroughs or who's been doing all the photography here? That's me. That's you. <laughs> I, um, I take the best artifact pictures that I've ever seen. And, and, and the other scholars, uh, they say the same thing. But I go to great pains. Uh, the, the, all of the ones with the blue background are mine. All of the artifacts with the red background are Virginia Horrigans. And there are, other, there are other people who have taken some good pictures of the artifact. Uh, but they, uh, the, the color might not be wrong. You can't see all the characters. When I see an artifact, I want that artifact to be the correct color, and I want to be able to see every character on it. And some of the artifacts, granted, are just too large. You can't do it. You can't get a close-up of everything all in one uh, picture, e even if it's 15 megs. It's just hard to do because there's a, there's a slope on many of the artifacts and and that's it's just very difficult. And so these the ones that you've shot with the blue background, they are uh, artifacts that you've bought from uh, from Russell then, correct? Uh, some of them, some of them are from other people's collections. Uh, most of them are from other people's collections that I've met through the years. And uh, and then uh, then there are people I've had several, I've had many myself. I've uh, been wheeling and dealing in these artifacts now for what almost 20 years, and um, and I've now I've only got I had uh, I lost 15 artifacts in a in a, in a disastrous fire, and um, you know uh, some of the uh, alien artifacts. That's what I liked mostly, <laughs> and uh, but I I've still got uh, one two three four four or five pieces big nice pieces, and some of my friends here in the local area there are. Probably in the local area here, over 200, 250 owned by different people. Oh, yeah. And then there are other people that own hundreds of this and that. There are, there's only, I believe, one collection that I don't have full uh, photographs of. So there's a lot of different people out there who has, uh, throughout the years, it's uh, changed hands perhaps, it's been bought and sold, etc. Uh, is there any idea at this stage who have someone trying to like index it all? I mean, that's I guess that's something that you've been trying to do to just get a scope of how much we're talking about, how many artifacts, how many different uh, you know coins, etc. Yes, uh, we tried. That was one of the first things we wanted to do back in 1994. But Burroughs had told people, his buyers, that if he had anything to do with Paul and Harry, that he would stop selling them stones. Don't have anything to do with them. Don't have anything to do with them. And um, and so his uh, main buyers, who had these massive collections, they uh, they wouldn't they, they wouldn't let us see any of their pictures. They wouldn't send us pictures. They wouldn't let us. Uh, they wouldn't let me photograph their stones or anything, because they were scared to death that Burroughs was going to cut them off from artifact sales. And we told them at the time, back in uh, 1995, we told everybody stop buying the artifacts. In the uh, summer of 1994, after Burroughs saw the video, I told him, I said, now you need to stop selling artifacts. Oh, no, no, no. I got to sell. I got to make money. And, and right after, I told him not to sell any artifacts. And he'd been telling us that he had no artifacts. He brought in my room, my uh, hotel room, probably 10 boxes full of just beautiful pieces. I mean beautiful pieces. Incredible artifacts. I bought a I bought a uh, Carrera marble bust of Julius Caesar. Does anyone want Julius Caesar on the stone? Yul Caesar. Before we get the modern day word Caesar. 
just I mean, just incredible art. He had a he had an Octavian tablet. He had a couple of Cleopatras. Yeah, he just amazing stuff. So after as we did more decipherments and Burroughs was able to watch and study our videos, we told people to stop buying the artifacts because Burroughs now knows enough to fake them or to start adding to them or tainting them and that that's what he was going to do. He told me he was going to do it. And that's what he did. Any uh, The artifacts purchased from these by these people after summer of 1995 have all been tainted. So there is a large portion of these artifacts that have been uh, tampered with, f uh, forged, and that is uh, something that does cloud the issue, so to speak. Well, indeed. Uh, does Burroughs or anyone else, as far as you know, uh, have anyone been granted access to the property to get into the caves by the owner at this point, or has it pretty much been no one is allowed in after t year 2000 when he uh, bought it? No. Uh, we had finished. We were in the middle of doing some testing when um, when when he when the property was purchased, and uh, there has been some people, pot hunters out there digging, scratching around. There's some people that have done, put some videos up online um, that um, that are just really shoddy, just you know, child's play stuff. But no, there's not been a serious uh, dig since uh, since I left it in '96. But I had leased the property just south of where we actually ended up determining that it was. Well, that's a, that that's a big uh, problem. And again, I mean, uh, is it, what needs to? Uh, I, there's so much more of this we need to talk about here. Um, Harry, we, we'll get into the, sure. what's on the uh, you know artifacts, and obviously the the writing is a specific part to hold, the, all of this that we need to discuss. But um, w what could what could unlock the situation so that something could begin to move a little bit here? Uh, what do you think? Uh, somebody coming up and buying the property. That's, that's it. all it takes. Yeah. Somebody buys the property; it's a done deal. Two days later, they are a multi, multi, multi billionaire. <laughs> it would take about two, two or three days to get in. What ha what we believe happened is that the as as Burroughs Burroughs has, has been extremely evasive uh, and uh, adamant about not letting anybody in there. Whatever our theory at this point is that perhaps the entrance that he was using collapsed because the soil here has a lot of clay in it. And you dig a hole, it's going to eventually just collapse it on, on top of itself. And as he removed the stone entrance, the stone blocks at the entrances of each one of the crypts, then eventually uh, 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 a massive flood like we had just a few days ago would cause the whole thing to, to flood out and he would, and probably most of it has been destroyed. He was talking about scrolls being down there and ancient papyri. Well, now they would have all been uh, um, destroyed or, or turned to paper, to just to dust, to ash. Who knows? And all of that would have been gone. All of that. And the funny thing is that according to uh, uh, the classical historians, there was a book at the foot of Alexander's cadaver when he was displayed in Alexandria. And in that book, all of the notables that visited his tomb signed the guest book. Hmm. And I had asked Burroughs back in the mid-90s, do you remember any kind of book or scroll being at, you know, in the main crypt? This is back before we even told him who it was. Oh, yeah, there was a book there. Yeah, there was something there. Some had, had a bunch of funny writing in it. What would a book be worth that had the signatures of Pompeii, uh, all of the uh, Roman Republic uh, consuls, Octavian, Julius Caesar, Mark Anthony? What would Julius Caesar's autograph be worth today? Quite a bit. <laughs> and, or, or Queen Cleopatra, or all the Cleopatras and Bernie, and all of the Soders. Uh, I mean, excuse me, all of the Ptolemies. What, what would a book that had all of these autographs 
what would it be worth? It, it, the, the sky's it just it, it would be priceless, absolutely priceless. And that's probably that probably got destroyed. Hmm. Well, that's yeah. a that's a damn shame. Obviously, if that if that's the case here, and and, and uh, speculation. Uh, sure, sure. What has been the academic response, if any, to these claims and the work you and uh, uh, that you've been doing over the years now? Uh, from what country? United States or abroad? A any anywhere. Okay, United States. These uh, guys, they don't really know that much. American scholarship is really down the tubes. Uh, they're there's there's nothing there this is all uh strictly mainframe institutionalized uh, uh there's very few people that think outside the box uh, modern archaeology here are uh people that go to uh, college for 15 years and they go buy a spatula and dig up arrowheads out in the field i'm serious and but now abroad we have been uh, uh accepted much more widely why is that do you think uh uh, it's pretty obvious, man. I, I'd call it uh, ignorance with a capital I. They're so locked into their their dogmas of Columbus first. They don't want to hear uh, Scott Walter on the History Channel talk about the authenticity of the Kensington runestone. Yeah. They don't want to hear Scott Walter talking about all the history that we've been taught is wrong, which he's right. He's 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 uh, kicking butt and taking names, and he's really forging it. And when and Scott Walter's a friend of mine. And, and he told me, you know, when when I was uh, visiting with him, he goes, Harry, I've kicked that door down. I've kicked that Columbus first door down. All you got to do now is push it and, you know, walk right through it. And it's a little bit difficult. When you're trying to change history, uh, academic history, in North America, you have no scholarly friends. There, you have no friends. You have no friends. Yeah. They're, they're scared to death to touch it. We, we've seen it in the past. People like L.A. Waddell, we, we, you know. Exactly. Uh, uh, what's his name now? The other guy who discovered the, uh, I forget his name. There's lots of these uh, older, you know, uh, if you go back a hundred years or, or so that, that I, I've done some tremendous work on, on many of these sites, of course, and consequently it's been uh, covered up. And I can't help to think, Kerry, that there is a an active cover-up potentially part of this as well. We, we've I mean, talked quite extensively in the past about the Smithsonian's involvement in in not recognizing the giant skeletons that's found around uh, America, but also other parts of the world. So could that be something here? They're trying to just keep the lid all on? All giants are found all over. They've got small people all over. I can show you cities carved into cliffs out in New Mexico and Arizona where the doorways are like 18 inches tall. And it's not just one or two. It's like hundreds of them. All right. And... And and they just suppress anything. There have been ancient coins, Alexander coins, Roman coins, all found all over this country. They're they're now finding Egyptian hieroglyphs all over the coast of Canada, uh, and it's just a, a a big wash. And I was glad to hear you mention L. A. Waddell because he is one of my heroes, and he his uh, alphabet tables were essential in deciphering these tablets. Yeah. Barry Fell, that was one of the other guys I was thinking about, too. Um, why don't we, we're going to take a break here in a little bit, Harry, but give us just a little tidbit of, of some of the things that have been found, the carvings on the on the stones before we take a break, and some of your favorite ones. Uh, uh, some very interesting creatures are, are showing up on some of these stones. What What is that? Uh, you name it. Uh, my favorites, I guess, got to be the, the beautiful naked women, of course. So. <laughs> Uh, but uh, there's dozens of those. Um, just, I mean, unbelievable that you can carve on a black rock a, a woman and get facial features and body figures so accurate and so good without any mistakes. These artifacts have no boo-boos. There's not like a, I can, I can barely draw a picture on a piece of paper with a, with a pencil and, and, and get it all perfect the first time. And many of these artifacts have thousands and thousands of lines, tiny little lines, and they're all perfect. Perfect. These artisans were just incredible. And there are um, all kinds of uh, everything from birthdays to uh, uh, greeting cards, science, uh, science tablets, history tablets. Uh, there's um, tablets that appear to be some type of ancient form of music, but we don't know. And uh, there's some kind of Carthaginian numbering system 
uh, that runs throughout these tablets, which we don't understand. Um, and there are um, tablets that are that like um, it might be um, an Egyptian syntax using Latin characters. Uh, you may have a Greek god in Latin. Latin characters. Uh, you may have a script with a Punic, Greek, and Latin, just the different characters. They wrote as they spoke, and they used whatever. They knew everything. You know, they uh, people from the Mediterranean. Uh, they the the common people. They would speak in whatever language that they came from, and only the upper echelons actually were literate enough to read and write. Uh, same with Egyptian, same with uh, the uh, the Catholic priest in Latin. It was uh, uh, even the uh, Berlanda text from England. The, um, the everybody well didn't have the ability to read and write, but you may have someone who was an artisan who could carve a rock and carve uh, uh, someone's head and make it. I mean, if the guy came in the room, oh sure, that's him. That's that's that guy, but he couldn't read or write. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, there, how, how how vast do you think the time span is from the different um, artifacts and objects, and in, including the writing? Good question. Because it appears that many of the artifacts were two thousand years old, two thousand years ago. Hmm. So that means that uh, this is a historic treasure to maybe even the people who who came there and and wanted to preserve it, have it with them, pretty much. A lot of it must have been pilfered out of the uh, library and museum at Alexandria. Wow. Well, it's a, it's a fascinating story, and of course we're going to continue to talk more about this. We, we are going to discuss the, uh, the, the the strangeness of the depictions on some of these uh, stones and, and what could, you know... Well, what we we it's it has to do with the ancient astronauts again. Yet yet again, we have to we have to go there because this is what is shown on some of them. We'll talk about this, and of course the uh, the uh, the language, the the decipherment of of the writing that's on these uh, stones as well. We'll get there. But uh, Harry, before we uh, stop here then and take a break, let's talk about the websites where people can go to find out more. I want to hear about the titles of your uh, books where people can read more about the story. So uh, please go ahead, Harry. My first book was titled Ancient Mediterranean Treasure in North America. My second book is titled The Curse of Alexander's Tomb. They are both on ebooks and they are available at alexanderhelios.com. My website or mine and Paul's website is illinoiscaves.com. And there's a lot of information there. A lot of pictures of artifacts, and it is an old website. It came on in uh, 1997, and we've just done nothing but add to it through the years. And it has a lot of articles on there, pro and con. Um, it has a bunch of bios concerning a lot of the people and just some, some of the most strange things that you would ever imagine people doing or saying or accomplishing. It's just unbelievable. And then we, uh, we're on Facebook that has a lot of uh, traffic on it. And I put up a new gold medallion or something every week and, 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 or, or um, an alien artifact or something, which we'll get into in the second hour. And that is called the Illinois Caves, and, we're, and I believe that's also the Twitter account. So anything that's put on uh, the Illinois Caves Facebook also transfers into Twitter some way somehow. That's um, our our uh, our uh, uh, computer genius Zach at work there. So very good. I want to say thanks to Zach as well, by the way, who helped uh, helped us to get in contact with you, Harry. So so that's uh, excellent that he could do that. Perfect. He's one of your biggest fans. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's awesome yeah. when we can connect with new people, and and I. Uh, you know, haven't heard actually about your work until uh, Zach contacted me about it. So I'm, uh, we really, f you know, appreciate that he did that. And uh, so again, then here just to reiterate, IllinoisCaves.com and AlexanderHelios.com. Please go there, take a look uh, now in the break here before we continue in the next uh, segment here for our members and look at the pictures, look at the photos. Um, there are some fascinating ones. So uh, stay with us, everyone. We'll be right back with more with Harry. Mm -hmm. 